And thank you everyone uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Jared White and I'm the Farm and Faith Partnerships Project Manager uh, at RAFI. Uh, together with our knowledgeable and experienced special guests, uh, this evening we'll be talking about the production, financial, marketing, and networking aspects of starting a CSA. Uh, so if you are farming and you want to create a community that values and supports your work, uh, then a CSA could be right uh, for you and your farm business. Uh, first, uh, I'll share a little bit about Rafi and who we are, uh, what a CSA is and how it works, and then we'll pass it to our panelists for a farmer-led discussion. And then after that, there will be time for Q&A and questions. Um, and before we get started, um, I'd like to offer uh, my colleagues an opportunity uh, to introduce themselves. Um, and it would be great if uh, I'll pass it to someone and the next person uh, can pass it on. Um, I'll pass it to Ray first. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ray Jeffers. I'm the Farm of Color Network Director here at Rathi. I've been with Rathi almost uh, coming on almost three years now. And I direct our Farm of Color Network, which is a membership of over 800 uh, farmers of color throughout the Southeast U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. And I'll pass it. I'm also a farmer myself. So I'll pass it on to Angel. Hi, um, I am Angel Woodrum. I work here at Rafi as well. Um, I work as our market access coordinator. So I work with farmers who are starting CSAs for their first season or beyond. Um, just you know, help giving them some tips, talking through things um, of that nature. And I too have a small farm in High Point, North Carolina, doing um, diversified vegetables. So I will pass that to Carolina. Thank you, Angel. So my name is Carolina Alzate. I work in Rapi as an outreach um, manager, and I work with farmers, especially in in the territories in Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, and in some NRCS projects with conservation. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm one of a CSA fan, so super happy to to have all of our panelists, farmers with great experience in this. And I'm going to pass it to you again, Jerry. Oh, thank you. Uh, so if we can move to the next slide. Um, in terms of some webinar housekeeping, uh, please stay on mute for the whole webinar, um, unless it's during the Q&A time. Uh, as you saw earlier through the warning, the webinar is being recorded, and this recording will be shared with all attendees afterwards. Um, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, um, your name, where you're calling in from, uh, and it would be also great to learn like what you're producing. Um, and please think of questions during the webinar. Uh, feel free to add them to the chat or you can save them for the Q&A later. Uh, so I'd like to mention uh, and talk a little bit about Rafi uh, as an organization. Uh, established in 1990, uh, Rafi uh, is a farm advocacy nonprofit that's based in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. Uh, at Rafi, we do a lot of work challenging the root causes of unjust food systems, uh, supporting and advocating for economically, racially, and ecologically just farm communities. This means envisioning uh, a thriving and sustainable and equitable food system, a food system where farmers and farm workers have dignity and agency, uh, where they are supported by just agricultural policies, and where corporations and institutions are held accountable to their community. Uh, so for farmers, this means technical assistance, financial assistance, resources for resilient farms, market opportunities, and addressing federal policy. Uh, Rafi's Farmer of Color Network, uh, oops, if you can move back to the, there we go. Um, so Rafi's Farmer of Color Network, uh, develops relationships with farmers of color in order to support and honor multi-generational organizing, sustainable agricultural practices, and ancestral traditions and knowledge. Uh, farmers of color in the U.S. have long been disadvantaged by systemic and institutional racism, including discrimination in accessing credit, 
loans, resources, and markets. As a result, farmers of color make up just, uh, just under 5% of all farmers in the United States. And so Rafi founded the Farmers of Color Network to support these farmers and grow their numbers. The network provides farmer-led technical assistance and funding opportunities, hosts farm tours, networking events, and gatherings to highlight uh, those ancestral traditions and knowledge, as well as exploring market solutions. Uh, currently, the program serves farmers of color uh, throughout the Southeast US, especially lower mid-Atlantic, the US Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. Um, perfect. And uh, another program within RAFI, uh, within RAFI's work, Come to the Table's mission is to empower faith communities to participate in the creation of a just food system through collaboration, capacity building, and advocacy. Uh, we believe that faith communities have a key role to play in this work. And as a part of its role in connecting faith communities to people and resources in the food system, Come to the Table is the home for Rafi's Farm and Faith Partnerships Project. Um, the goal of the Farm and Faith Partnerships Project is to work against injustices in the food system that harm farmers of color and rural communities by creating mutually beneficial and self-sustaining economic partnerships between farmers of color on the one hand and faith groups in their community on the other. Uh, these relationships uh, result in farmers of color uh, gaining additional sources of income and increased access to new local markets and rural community members uh, gaining increased food security and access to fresh and healthy foods. Our goal is that through these farm and faith relationships, Congregations are able to participate in the building of a thriving local food system and economy while also engaging in relational ministries with farmers in their communities. While these commun I'm sorry, while these connections look different depending on the context, uh, the primary form that these partnerships take is a CSA. So we wanted to take uh, a moment uh, to establish kind of a shared definition and answer to the question of what is a CSA? Uh, if you can move to the next, excuse me, move to the next slide. Perfect, thank you. Um, CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture and is an economic model used by farmers and producers to secure a prepaid market for their produce before the produce is even harvested. Uh, Booker T. Watley, an Alabama horticulturalist, an author, uh, and Tuskegee University professor, examined efficient farming practices which allowed the small farmer to make the most of their farm while making a decent living. Uh, so pictured there on the left-hand side of the screen is the cover of his book, how to Make $100,000 Farming 25 Acres, uh, which was published in 1987. This book explores his 10 commandments of farming that assist the farmer in minimizing unnecessary costs while limiting waste and maximizing income and farm space with smart crop selection. One of uh, Watley's 10 commandments was the importance of what he called a clientele membership club. Members of this club paid an initial membership fee, which contributed to the success of the farm. In return, they received fresh produce that they would pick themselves. This ensured a constant cash flow into the farm while saving on time and labor. Uh, Dr. Watley identified this as an essential aspect of a successful farm in the 1960s and 70s. And today, this idea is commonly referred to as community-supported agriculture and is becoming increasingly popular uh, as the demand for local food continues to grow. Uh, the main benefits that Dr. Watley described in his book still hold true today. 
Uh, the advantages for farmers are that in a CSA, uh, you're able to plan production, anticipate demand, uh, and have a guaranteed market for your produce. You can focus on marketing the food early in the year uh, before days in the field begin. Farmers are also able to receive payment early in the season, uh, which can help with the farm's cash flow. And TSAs also create an opportunity uh, for the farmer to get to know the people who are buying and consuming the produce that they grow. Additionally, uh, as a farmer, you'll know that there's a market for the food that you're growing. With a CSA, you won't have to wonder uh, how you will move your produce at a farmer's market or sell it to a wholesaler. There are also advantages for consumers. Uh, for consumers, the food that they receive is often harvested that day or the day before, and so it's often very fresh and tastes great. Uh, consumers are exposed to new vegetables and often new ways of cooking. And for consumers, uh, CSA farms often provide member benefits, including farm visits, recipes, and days when members of the CSA uh, can come to the farm and maybe pick some of their own produce. Um, all of these things, in addition uh, to the fact that consumers uh, are often able to develop a relationship with a farmer who grows their food and learn more about how the food is grown. Um, and so with that, uh, I'm going to pass it to Ray, who's going to uh, introduce our panelists, as well as get our discussion going uh, regarding their experiences as uh, farmers administrating and facilitating a CSA. All right, thank you, Jared. Uh, we are very fortunate and lucky tonight to have with us uh, some experienced farmers in this area. And so first I'd like to introduce Rocky Ridge Farm. Rocky Ridge Farm is a 30-acre fruit, nut, and vegetable farm in Lewisburg, North Carolina, committed to farming using organic methods, to living in harmony with nature, supporting the local economy, and serving as a day trip destination for affordable family fun. Founded by Steve and Elkie McCalla, understanding that connection to the earth facilitates the rest restoration of our body, mind, and spirit. The desire to help others reconnect to inner peace and restore purpose to their lives is their dream uh, for their farm. We also have with us tonight Brown Family Farms. The mission of Brown Family Farms is to help provide an alternative, holistic solution to customers, naturally by processing and manufacturing industrial hemp plants, natural herbs, and organic vegetables. Located in Southeast Warren County, North Carolina, in the Hex Grove community, the farm was established in 1865 by first-generation farmer Byron Brown. Patrick Brown cultivates grain and industrial hemp as now the fourth-generation farmer on the estate. Patrick has become a beloved figure in his community of Warren County, where he consults, educates, and supports outreach and education programs for diversity in agriculture. Uh, we also have Transplanting Traditions. Uh, they support food sovereignty in the refugee community through access to land, education and opportunities for refugee farmers to address community food insecurity and the barriers they face in reaching their dreams of farming. The farm provides a cultural community space for refugee adults and youth to come together, recreate home, recreate home and build healthy communities and continue agricultural traditions in the Piedmont of North Carolina. Farmers at Transplanting Traditions operate 170 plus member CSA and sell at the Chapel Hill Farmer's Market, the Carboros Farmer's Market, and the South Durham Farmer's Market. The farmers grow a mix of familiar seasonal vegetables and Southeast Asian vegetables, traditionally grown in Burma. Though not certified, all, our, all their produce is grown organically without the use of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, or fungicides. So we would like to welcome all of you all tonight. And I have a few questions that uh, I will get us kind of started on and feel free that if we cover something that that uh, my questions don't cover something that you definitely you know wanted to share tonight, uh, please feel free to to go ahead and add that in. And I think we will start um, first with Rocky Ridge Farm, and we want you to tell us a little bit about your CSA. You know, what are you producing? Who are your members? Uh, how are you getting them their food, and kind of so forth. 
Go ahead. Hi, everybody. How you doing? I'm Steve from Rocky Ridge Farm. And we've got us a nice little CSA here. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a preview as how we started out. Initially, we started out selling vegetables at uh, the Wake Forest Farmer's Market. And we noticed that in order to really sell a lot of vegetables, we had to waste a lot of vegetables. I would say we took in maybe about, say, N number of pounds of vegetables to the farmer's market. And I would say maybe 30% of the vegetables that we brought there actually ended up from a financial point of view, being wasted. A lot of times we would donate the vegetables or they'd go somewhere else, but it really didn't turn into direct cash flow into our pockets. So we began to start to look around for other opportunities. And I saw other people had started CSAs, but I really didn't know anything about the format or how to go about putting any of this together. And then out of the blue, we ran into Jared. <laughs> and he was saying, hey guys, pretty much, would you like the guys to, to start a CSA? And I said, well, yeah, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> Where do we sign up? <laughs> so needless to say, we became enmeshed in Rafi. We got enmeshed with the Agricultural Extension Office. And actually through these connections, we meet, met a great number of other people who were pretty much interested in the same thing, i.e. farming and being able to market their produce successfully. So the way this actually worked was Jared knew some people in his, uh, I would say, I would call it his theology network. <laughs> and that would be Gary and a couple other people of several key churches here in the Raleigh area. And he put us over to them and we kind of worked with them and they worked from, with us. And we began to develop a plan through which we could grow our vegetables here on the farm and then put them out to the church members. So what this really ended up working out to be was we would grow and, and uh, put together our vegetables during the week and got them together. And then pretty much on Saturday morning, we picked up, we, we set up a drop off point at one of the churches. So in this network, it wasn't just us there were five or six other farmers of which Rick Brown here is one of them. And we all had, were dedicated to a given church to be able to provide those vegetables. So Saturday morning, we would go down there and we would drop off the vegetables. Again, we spent a little time at the churches to be able to socialize and kind of mix it up a little bit with the, the church members that we're dropping the uh, materials off with. So they got to know us. And again, it produced a sense of food security for the people that were purchasing the vegetables because they got to know us as the farmer. And as they got to know us better and better, we started to have uh, events out at our farm by which we were able to introduce them because we grow chestnut trees. So we would have like chestnut roastings or have people come out. And then sometimes people would come out and actually help us out on the farm. We'd have a work day on the farm. Very similar to what you saw there with uh, uh, Mr. What was his name? Watkins. What was his name? With the book. Yeah, I don't remember. I don't name. remember his name either. I'd like to, but it was uh, what's uh, yeah, we had Booker volunteer like days right. where um, you know we had our CSA members come out to the farm and they were able to um, contribute their time and actually. Like what would have taken us probably, I would say, two months of concentrated effort. Like they did it in three hours, like 20 people with their trimmers and uh, pruners and they cleared out our grapevines and, you know, they were so enriched by coming to help us and we were felt so supported, you know, um, by their help and enthusiasm and, you know, the agriculture is, is the heart of it all. Dave, I'm going to stop you guys right there because you, you're kind of deving, answering some of the questions I have for later. So I'm going to hold, gonna hold you off right now. Excellent. <laughs> All right. And we'll go to uh, Transplanting Traditions. If they could talk a little bit about uh, what you're producing, you know, kind of how you learned about the C uh, CSA model and who are your members.
Um, if um, one of you can share our PowerPoint, that would be great. Do you have a, yours there? Yeah, it's the same, um, the one with Nora share with you. Okay, perfect. So oh. I'm going to start sharing right now. So here. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is um, Tadawa. Um, I'm a program educator and also a farmer at Transplanted Traditions Community Farm. Uh, this evening, I'm here with um, my co-worker, Nora, and I'm going to talk about um, a little bit about Transplanted Traditions Community Farm and our CSA. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, I'm going to talk about um, TDCF, CSA, and then my coworker is going to talk about marketing and planting methods. <laughs> Um, so TDCF started out as a community garden project under the Orange County Partnerships for Young Children to meet and express needs from farmers from Burma um, to have access to land to farm on um, because the farmers have really rich agricultural backgrounds and desire to continue farming in the U.S. And it's expanded into grants funded program in 2010. And in 2018, uh, we became our own independent nonprofits and it's expanded to eight acres. Um, the land we are on is rented from um, Triangle Land Conservancy and the farmers perform a variety of um, sustainable agriculture practices, including growing with USDA organic approved fertilizers, pesticides, and then we're using cover crops to maintain the soil. Um, all of the farmers are refugees from Burma and many farm in Thailand or Burma. Most are ethnically Korean, but some are Chin. Um, so social isolation is a major issue with this community. And many people were separated from their families when they went to refugee camp. And again, when they resettled in United States. Um, Trauma-related depressions and social isolations are common because of resentment, and the farm provide a space for participants to rebuild their community and form networks of support. Next slide, please. Um, for our CSA, we have um, the first one is we have um, 24 weeks, which run from um, April to November. Uh, with about 180 members split between four farmers with the options of adding eggs or flowers. Um, this year, we have 12 egg shares, and for flowers, we have about 50 shares. The second one is um, Winter CSA, which lasted for 13 weeks, with about 97 members split between two farmers. Um, and during winter CSA season, um, we don't have any at all options. Um, the pros and cons of um, the 24 weeks seasons, um, it's a lot of farmers who are learning to balance trade-off and it's easier to manage. Um, TTCF is very unique because the staff manage the customer service, outreach, accounting, and then the farmers just farm and pack. Um, we don't use software because we have um, full-time staff who manage the CSA and many farmers who do it all will use software to save time. Um, the downside is um, may, we may lose some customers who travel during summer or don't want to commit to such a big part because they have to pay a huge amount upfront. Um, <clears throat> the other pros is uh, Payment plan make it more accessible to customer, but make it more complicated for staff to manage. Um, this is another place where software could be helpful. And the third, um, the third 
the third CSA is the Carrier Academy Asian Vegetables. Um, the Carrier Academy Asian Vegetables CSA runs only six weeks long from August to, to September. And then these give opportunity for new farmers to try out the CSA models on a similar in a small scale with crops that they are culturally relevant to them. Uh, we partnership with Care Academy and then it's give um, the student opportunity to develop uh, leadership skills because they do all the marketing and they do the outreach for the CSA. Um, sorry, back to the last slide. <laughs> Um, the payments install the payment plan we offer monthly. We used to uh, last year we started doing the monthly payments, and then this is not ideal because um, the farmers don't get paid on time. And then, for example, if they want to purchase um, a hoop house, which costs for three thousand, they couldn't buy it at once. They have to save up for uh, multiple months. So. Um, we will go back to just one payment per season, one for spring, one for summer, and one for fall. Um, last year is our first time we start doing 24 weeks season CSA. Um, with the month of August break, because August is very hot and humid, and the farmers are tired, they get it ready for fall planting. So we took that whole month off, and then um, the mo this model went well, and then it's preferred by the farmers. Um, <clears throat> the only downside is um, makeup weeks. We also offer makeup week. We used to offer it like one in spring, one in summer, and one in fall. Since last year we do it 24 weeks, we offer it at the end of the year, which is a lot because the farmer has to do four boxes toward the end of the year. So this year we plan, I mean, this coming year, we plan to do one makeup week in August and one makeup week in November. And for pickup locations, we do farmer's market, private home, business who donate spaces. And then we also offer different days of the week, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday, and also different location, which is in Chapel Hills, Cabo Rowe, and then Durham. And the farmers also hiring a uh, driver because some farmer couldn't drive or couldn't read um, GPS. So it's more ideal for them to hire um, a drivers and then they all pay into that. And for winter CSA, a volunteer um, driver get a share in exchange of their times. Um, now I'm gonna pass it to Nora. Um, did you want us to continue to the marketing or was that going to be like a another question series? I think uh, we'll let you go ahead and finish this and that way we'll come back to our questions and then we can just go through without having to, you know, share the screen again. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so the... So the CSA has been going for about 10 years now. So um, there's been a lot of trial and error. And so um, there has definitely been, there were a lot more challenges in the beginning um, that we learned from. So for the first 10 years, it was um, it was difficult to find and retain customers. Um, and so 2020 was the first year that we sold out and we had a wait list, um, most likely due to COVID, people were a bit more conscious of eating local. Um, but the main ways that we were able to get a good customer base is by uh, connecting with existing communities, um, faith communities, and also local companies. Um, that was really helpful in relationship and community building. So it creates a sense of loyalty and attachment to the CSA. Um, so the customers feel proud to be a part of something that where they're supporting local farmers. So like Dawa said, um, the farmer's market is one of the pickup locations. So when people are at the farmer's market doing their regular shopping, they'll see the CSA boxes and people picking them up. Um, so that helps create a little bit more interest of people that wouldn't have otherwise known about the CSA. Um, another way we were able to get customers was by participating in the Piedmont Farm Tour that happens every spring 
in the Piedmont area of North Carolina. Um, so this helps bring customers in. Um, we would put a CSA list on the table. People could sign up there and we do the same with other tours as well. So anytime there are tours on the farm or the public is coming to the farm, there's always an opportunity to sign up for the newsletter to hear about the CSA or um, sign up for the CSA. Um, building connections with faith communities was really big. So in the beginning, there were partnerships with churches and synagogues. So they would go, the um, the farmers and some of the staff would go do uh, presentations at these churches and synagogues to share about the farm. And then if 15 or more congregants signed up, they would offer that site as a pickup location. Um, so that was really helpful in building customer base and finding places to do pickup locations. Uh, another way we're able to get customers is by tapping into other farms that have really big followings that sell out quickly. So that was done two times with a farm um, that is nearby that we have connections with. Since their CSA would sell out so quickly, we would ask them to mention on their social media that if people were still interested in signing up for a CSA, they could sign up for the Transplanting Tradition CSA. So having those farmer connections was really helpful to getting customers as well. Um, we also did connections with businesses. So there's a coffee shop in Durham that was a pickup site. And the, the business offered an employee benefit where they would pay for half of the cost of the share of the CSA if the employee signed up. Um, there was tabling at community events. And... Um, one way that um, was really helpful was tapping into what some people might call the super connector friends. So we all know that person that seems to know everybody in your area. Um, so talking to that person about the CSA, asking them to tell their friends and family about it um, made a huge impact in getting people to sign up for the CSA. We also offered incentives. So um, CSA customers that refer a friend would receive a discount. Um, there are ways to post on social media like Instagram and Facebook where you can pay for that platform to boost your ad so it's um, seen by more people. And then at this point um, for the Transplanting Traditions CSA, the main thing is retention. Um, but that did take 10 years to get to that point. So at this point, it's keeping track of who comes back each year. Um, and so that can be helpful if there's a year that we don't, um, all of our spots are not yet full. If we see a customer who is usually a repeat customer and they hadn't signed up, we can go contact them and ask them if they'd like to sign up. Um, and it helps build that customer loyalty too. Um, use, utilizing volunteer labor. So um, we would have a volunteer that in exchange for volunteering their time, they would get a share uh, for free and they would sit at the pickup site um, instead of just dropping it off so that when people come to pick it up, there's someone to chat to about what's in the box, um, the events that might be coming up on the farm, and it just helps build that sense of community. Um, and then that person also, if there were shares left over at the end, they'd get to take those home. Um, we do potlucks that used to be once a season. So it used to be three times a year, but now we just do it once a year since we have one CSA throughout three seasons. Um, and so that is a lot of work, but that was really helpful in building a sense of community. So customers would come to the farm, They'd all bring a dish, hopefully something they made with their vegetables from the CSA box. And they would get a tour of the farm. They would get to meet the farmer that's packing their box. Um, and that helps build that shared sense of um, the importance of local food. Um, there's a weekly newsletter that all customers get um, at the beginning of the week so they can prepare their groceries for the week. So it's sent out on Monday. So they have time to think about how they want to plan around the vegetables that they're going to get. 
So there's also recipes on the website so they can kind of think about what they want to make and then, um, you know, hopefully be excited about the produce that they're getting. There is a lot of customer service work involved in this, um, which is really only possible because there is a full-time staff person at Transplanting Traditions to do this work, but it has meant that we sell out and always have a wait list now that we have those very loyal customers. And there's a really big following because people know that um, they really like the mission of the farm and they know that we are really responsive when they have questions um, and we're flexible. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of the way the farming is done for the CSA, um, they have figured out over many years, they have a crop plan um, with the number of plants that are needed to cover vegetables for a CSA box for the season. So for example, farmers have figured out that they need three cilantro plants, um, or sorry, five cilantro plants planted in three successions in order to cover um, the boxes for the spring season. Um, and so that's something that was figured out with trial and error so that they don't have to um, put, have as much waste um, and they can really keep notes on what they have too much of or what they don't have enough of so they can make adjustments in the following year's crop plan. So by following the crop plan, they're able to figure out what really works for them um, and they have some consistency as well. Um, the way the planting calendar is created is basically by working backwards. So you plan out each week and what you would put in the CSA box, making sure that you have a lot of variety. And then you work backwards with how long it takes um, for those plants to get to maturity. And that's how you figure out the planting dates. Um, one thing that's been very helpful for setting our CSA apart from other CSAs is growing something that's unique. Um, so for the farmers at Transplanting Traditions, because they grow a lot of Asian vegetables, um, they'll add those to the CSA box, just one or two. So it's not overwhelming to customers that aren't familiar with them. Um, and something that doesn't seem as daunting that people might have a bit more of an interest in. So fresh baby ginger, as opposed to bitter melon. Um, so we found that just one or two um, interesting vegetables that other CSAs don't offer is very helpful in attracting and keeping customers. Um, we also offer a swap box. So when you pick up your vegetables each week, you can go through it and swap out anything you don't wanna take home. Um, so if you get bitter melon and you're really not a fan of that, you can swap it out for say a head of lettuce um, if that's in the swap box. So being able to look at that swap box um, allows you to figure out what doesn't uh, sell well, what the customers don't like, so you don't plant as, as much of that in the next year. Um, we also make sure there's a wide variety of vegetables in the box. So um, there always has to be something raw, um, something you can eat raw, something you can cook, an herb, a root vegetable, and then a couple other things. Um, so, and you don't want to have two varieties of the same vegetables, so two different types of radishes or a head of lettuce and a salad mix. Um, and we try to make sure that we're not repeating vegetables on consecutive weeks. So trying to space out radishes, doing it every other week um, so that people don't get bored. Um, and we also offer two different sizes of boxes. So there's a small box with only six items. Um, and that's $22. And then there's a regular box with seven items, which is 28. And I think that helps us get more customers and keep customers because they don't have to commit to the bigger uh, quantity. Um, and that is all for, for that. Thank you, Nora. Thank you. Uh, Patrick, we'll go to you now. We'll hear a little bit about your CSA and kind of what you're producing and how you got started and uh, some about your your members. Yes. Um, so our farm is located um, in Warren County, North Carolina, and our primary focus before starting the CSA was mostly wholesale production for food hubs and 
other small farms um, for their CSA program. Uh, we were introduced to Rafi um, a few years ago for the Farm to Faith Partnership Program, which allowed our small CSA that had already been established to grow uh, for more members. Um, in that CSA, we provide fresh produce 18, uh, 18 to 20 to 30 weeks a year uh, through St. Francis of CC Church with that food to table faith partnership that, um, like I said, was collaborated through Rafi. And then we also have just a small um, amount of members that are part of our local community CSA, which is also 18 to uh, 32 weeks out of the year. Some of the vegetables that we grow are traditional uh, broscas in the fall that consist of cabbage, collards, um, Brussels sprouts, Swiss chard, kale, um, just to name a few. Um, we do provide some specialty Asian um, variety crops, um, such as yucca and Napa cabbages. Um, we also offer mixed greens for spinach, um, mustards, and uh, turnips. In the spring and summer, we provide um, a, a facet of uh, squash, zucchini, um, lettuce, sweet corn, watermelon, honeydews, um, cucumbers, very, uh, various varieties of beans, silver holes, peas, um, Asian mustards, just to name a few. Um, we utilize our um, year-round growing source utilizing high tunnel production. We have um, one large high tunnel that is 30, 36 by 98 feet, which was a cost share program high tunnel through the NRCS. We also have a germination um, greenhouse where we germinate all our plants from seeds, uh, which are non-GMO seeds. Um, in that greenhouse is a 20 by 40, uh, fully auto automated with uh, fans and uh, heat, as well as um, the uh, side tunnels to allow the, the proper ventilation for our germination for our seeds. Uh, we also have extended lighting in our greenhouse that gives us additional light during months that we have less uh, sunlight. Um, we transplant. Uh, most of our transplants into row crops. We uh, operate 11 acres of row crop production for leafy greens, root vegetables, and um, other crops. We also provide grains for bread wheat companies uh, throughout North Carolina. One of our primary customers are Carolina Grow out of Asheville, where we grow Shirley wheat for their bread line. We also um, grow industrial hemp for fiber production for building manufacturing and textile production for clothing. So we try to be fully diversified, which allows um, running capital to come into our farm each and every uh, quarter to allow us to grow in capacity so that we can scale our farm um, consistently. Um, as the fourth generation steward, we also have the fifth generation working on the farm as well. We employ three um, employees that are on our farm each year outside of um, our family that currently works on the farm. Our CSA members that are under our program in our county, we kind of support Vance, Warren, Granville, Halifax, and Franklin for our local members. Um, we don't have a delivery service as of right now. We allow customers to come to our farm each and every week between Thursdays and Saturdays for local weekly box pickups. We also donate produce that is not, um, uh, is, is nutritious to eat and is still in good standing, but may not look appropriate for our members. So we donate that to our local food bank. Uh, we have a local food bank in Vance County, North Carolina, and that bank um, provides our, allows our produce to be provided to uh, convalescent homes and other charity organizations that provide food for the less fortunate. So we try not to waste any food. Um, vegetables that are not good enough to be put in those boxes are collected and composted within our uh, soil that we use for compost. 
Um, we utilize Atlas Organics compost out of Durham, North Carolina to provide us with 18 tons of mushroom um, organic compost twice a year that goes into our production for our plants. Um, we are GAP certified through the North Carolina Department of Agriculture, which is a Harmonized Plus program. We are audited once a year and we have to provide um, water sampling tests from our well water as well as our pond reservoirs that we utilize for irrigation. Our water is tested for E. coli and other bacteria through water ag out of Wilson, North Carolina. Um, we have participated in a CSA structure since 2017. Um, and we have been growing produce for food hubs and wholesale markets um, for over 60 years. Um, and we kind of continue to rotate some of our row crop acres for grain production um, into our uh, produce production where we utilize cover crops in the fall to help build organic matter in our soil and also help us with input costs as input costs for natural fertilizers are continuing um, to increase uh, due to economic situations. So we kind of try to focus on soil, um, the environment. We are utilizing a lot of climate resilience um, practices of, uh, in the way that we farm. We uh, try to use less tillage, more vertical tillage. Um, we, we try to make sure that we're utilizing the proper cover crops based on our soil agronomy testing so they can help us on input costs each and every year. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, we heard Steve and um, Transplanting Traditions talk about the use of volunteers on the farm. Are you, are you able to utilize any volunteers? Yes, uh, we are open to volunteers. We actually primarily focus on some of the youth programs to help volunteer on our farms as we try to provide an alternative approach to future farmers of America. In my county, that program is not existing. So we try to offer a way that allows some of the youth to come to our farm. We have a voluntary period every Saturday between 9 a.m. and 12 um, each and every uh, week that allows uh, the youth to come on onto our farm and learn some horticulture techniques that we utilize and how to grow food and understand where their food source comes from. And we also try to create ways to work with other organizations such as Boys and Girls Club to offer that assistance as well to some of the real younger youth so that they can understand. Um, and in any other way that we can cross volunteer to other farms um, to allow some of them to visit our farm or vice versa, we're also open to that. That's great. So you're making a whole community approach. And that's, that's wonderful. So I told you guys I'm a farmer. So I know we've got some farmers on here like myself that have thought about doing that CSA, but maybe just scared to take that jump or that leap uh, for fear of, you know, what if I don't have enough? What if I have a crop failure? Uh, how many boxes should I start? How many shares should I start out with? Do I just go gung ho and or do I start out a little bit by a little bit? Uh, we had a question in the chat uh, asking about the payments. You know, did you do installments or just take that one lump sum a year? Like, how did you all delve into it when you first decided to do it? Did you just go right into it or did you start out small? And uh, let's start with you, Steve and uh, Elke. Yeah, initially, um we did. We we jumped into it, you know, both feet and our heads <laughs> ended up over water <laughs> or underwater. Um, I think our initial um, CSA started out at 60 shares and we we could just bear it was everything we could do just to keep up with that. And um, so we learned very quickly, you know, our, our capacity. And um, right now, I think we found our. Um, do like our comfort our comfort zone, zone but like the maximum shares that we want to have for any um of the three seasons is is at 30 so um we found that that um that works for us um and what was what was the other question there was a couple of questions i think yeah i know i threw a lot there out you answer but we'll we'll let them uh, we'll let some of those kind of answer that and then we'll come back to some of those follow-ups 
Um, right. So transplant traditions, you know, I know you guys kind of got a different model. So you've got several farmers and stuff. So how did you kind of decide how many shares to start out with or to dev into the CSA model? Back in those time, um, the farmer started like with five shares. Right now, uh, my mom has with her alone, with the farmers alone, she has up to 70, 78 shares. So right now we set um, a limit. Like when you first started, you start with 10 and then you bump up a little bit each year. Very good. And Patrick, I know, you know, I'm, I'm working off a farm job. I know you was working off farm job. How do, how do you juggle all of that and, you know, get your planning done to, to take care of these shares? Well, we started out with a week by week um, opportunity that allows the customer to purchase a box every week and try to just uh, create a baseline for opportunity for marketing, because the main thing for us was to market the availability of what we had. And once we identified that market, then we figured out what the customer is looking to purchase each and every week. And we started out with one to two shares and then that grew to five to 10. And then with help with organizations like Rafi and creating partnerships with churches, that's when our shares really grew to give us an understanding. So I've always been a multitask type of guy, um, being able to work a full-time job and farm too. Um, just as much as I'm diversified in planting and agriculture, I'm just as much as diversified in business and entrepreneurship. So I've always been that type of person to always uh, have a lot going on, which helps me. Some people that's not good for them, but for me is where I feel most comfortable. And that's one thing I've been really pushing since being director of our Farmer Color Network is farming is a business and we've got to get our farmers to think that way uh, to continue to be successful and viable, uh, to not only stay on their land, but be successful at what they're doing. So I'm going to stay with you, Patrick. Pricing. How did you guys figure out your pricing? I mean, your size of your boxes. I know boxes are half bushel, bushel boxes. Or are you going by weight or just the items in there? Because some of them may be uh, specialized type items. Um, what What was your thought process into, into their pricing and what size or what to offer? Um, well, basically, pricing for us is to determine the labor costs of doing business, um, understanding how much affordable the seeds are the, for the type of varieties of vegetables that we want to market. And we go out and we look at what people are already buying. If people are comfortable at one, at whatever price that they're purchasing, say at your local grocery store, we always try to stay below that price point because quality and quantity are very important. So based on the amount of customers you have, that allows us to drive whichever margin that we're looking for, for profit and for capacity building. But when we first started, it wasn't mostly profit. Uh, profit is what, what we weren't mostly looking at. We were mostly looking at uh, the legit longevity of how we do business and what type of product we provide. And once we receive that feedback, then we are able to determine the overall goal for price. Thank you, Patrick. Steve and Elke? Well, we kind of um, did like a uh, comparison, like the the produce that we're putting in the box, like what would it cost you at your grocery store, you know, for that same thing? Because we wanted, you know, to provide value to the customer, but also um, not kind of undercut the, uh, the efforts that we do in terms of the um, regenerative practices that we use on the farm, which do take extra time. Um, like we, Steve makes... Uh, biochar that we use and we grind up and inoculate to enhance the soil and the um, covering with the different mulches and grasses to keep the soil from being bare. It's, it's very labor intensive. So um, we knew we had to price higher than, than the grocery store. And we're also delivering um, the vegetables to the, you know, a pickup site. So it's convenient for people. Um, so that's kind of how we did the framework for setting the price for, for our vegetables, for our shares. Thank you. Transplant traditions. We mm -hmm. noticed on your slide, you had your prices out there. So it seems like you already can give us your thought process. And we know you mentioned about having a smaller and a larger box. Yes. Um. Back then, we only do one share, which is like all the boxes are equal for $20, like many years ago, first when we started. 
and then we compare the price based on uh, what are we selling at farm farmers market. Um, also, we decided to go with um, two different sizes. It's based on the customer needs. They always request, oh, um, there's too much, and then they always have leftover vegetable. So we did decided to go with a smaller share and also regular share. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's stay with you, uh, Transplant Traditions, and then we'll move to the others. Uh, we're having some questions come in about succession planning. How did how did you all, um, you know, figure that part out? Did you work with, you know, your cooperative extension or are there templates out on on the web that you found? How did you go about? Uh, you know, we heard you mention. I know Patrick said he does anywhere between eighteen to thirty weeks. I think you all had like a twenty four week um, share. How did you go about making sure you had enough produce and things were growing for that long? So for us, what helps us is having a germination house um, that we always keep stocked so that once our uh, rows have been succeeded, we're able to plant right into them. Um, we like to harvest quite a bit of product at one time so that we can replant a certain amount so that it, we won't run out. That's the way or what helps succession planting for us. We only succession plant in our high tunnels. We don't set succession plant in our row crops because of the amount of acres that we do plant. Um, Transplant Traditions, Rocky Ridge, anything to add? Well, as far as the successions are concerned, what we were doing was we would actually just sit down and do the hardcore calculation of how many people we have in our CSA and if we say we were going to deliver beets, say once every other week, we figured out the number of people that we had, the number of pe number of beets that we wanted to give each person, and then we would just simply multiply that out and make sure we had maybe a probably about say twenty or thirty percent more plants than what we needed, especially in the high tunnels, because the survivability in the high tunnels is like much higher than in the fields in the event of deer or animals or whatever, and. We were able to kind of like see to the pants it out. And after doing this, maybe say two or three years, you've kind of got a good feel for the number of plants that you're going to need, the number of Swiss chards, the number of uh, lettuce plants that you're going to need, depends on whether you're selling it by the leaf or whether you're selling it by the head. You could calculate it out. And it, it was really more of a comfortable process as long as you didn't have any disasters that came along and wiped out a crop. So to that point, wipe a crop that may fail how are you guys communicating to your shareholders is, is i'm sure communication is a big key uh to those especially if they've you know already paid in advance and and that sort of thing yeah communication we've found is essential and we uh, also have a weekly newsletter that we send out to our members and um you know when something happens um it's communicated in there you know it's always it's always a hard thing to do because we want to um <laughs> You know, we we work so hard and and want to deliver the best, and then you know, here come the deer, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like we even had a comment. One of our uh, members had said, "Okay, well, how many shares did the deer buy?" <laughs> 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 but um, we have found that um, when it is communicated uh, like that, then the customers do, even though if they are disappointed they do understand and um not communicating it is where um you know you're going to start to lose members anything else to add um dawa or patrick all right let him go um we we don't have a problem we do have like a crop feeling once but um we bought it from other farmers like Within the community farm, if the farmers within the community farm don't have it, then we go out to farmer's market. We also know a lot of farmers who farm nearby and then we communicate with them. We buy stuff for them. So that's solve our problems. I tell you, y'all are good for teeing me up for my next questions. So partnering, are you guys partnering with other farms in case that you know, you do have that crop failure or to help provide variety, the things that you may not be growing or, you know, how is how is that working or do you do you do that? Well, here here at Rocky Ridge, we definitely do that. We, we are in a network. As a matter of fact, with all the other farmers 
that are in basically the Farmers of Color network, we pretty much help each other out. If I've got extra stuff, that's it's really not earmarked just for my farm. It's earmarked for anybody else who may have come up short that week. We also have another farm, another farmer across the road from us that we constantly work with. Maybe he'll give us basil. Maybe he'll give us Jerusalem artichokes. He'll give anywhere we can find anything that we can come in and say, well, we had a crop failure this week, but we can replenish that with this particular item. It's really a blessing just to have that. So, because you know, you, you don't want to come up with too many weeks of light boxes. Right? <laughs> Patrick, I saw you come off mute. You had something to add? Yes, absolutely. Um, our One of our business models for our farm and wholesale is to provide vegetables to local farms and other organizations that need um, a large amount of vegetables at one time. So we, um, we offer that service to any organization that's looking to purchase vegetables direct from our farm. Thank you. So, uh, transplant traditions. Anything to add there? Um, we don't partner with any other farms. Um, there is enough space that um, the farmers at Transplanting Traditions can grow everything. Um, I know some farmers will buy based on the stuff that takes up a lot of space. Uh, but like Dawa said, it we only buy from other farmers if there is a crop failure or um, maybe something came up light or it just doesn't look as good. We had something last week where there was just a lot of holes in sweet potatoes. So um, sometimes you just have to, it wasn't all of them, but sometimes you just have to supplement with other farmers. So we had a question come in to the Q&A and uh, I know Patrick, you said folks do on the farm pickup at your farm, but for those that deliver, are you working that delivery price in the price of the share or do you charge separately uh, for your delivery fee? We don't charge separate. Right. It's just in, included in the price of the share. Right. Same for you guys, uh, transplant traditions. Yeah, we also don't charge extra for that. Good. So I know I've thrown out some things, but uh, share with us some of the things that you may want to share with others on some challenges that you may have faced and kind of how you overcame them, you know, for your particular start with your CSA program. I would say uh, some challenges that we faced over the years was planning too much without having a viable um, purchase agreement with the organizations or individuals. Um, just because you have a lot of space and you plan a lot or able to plan a lot doesn't necessarily mean that you're able to market it. So uh, strategic planning, crop planning, and, and understanding the market of where your farm is located and your customer base is something that you really have to take account of before getting started. I would say it's kind of similar for transplanting traditions, just always over planting, um, trial and error to determine the number of plants needed to fulfill a CSA box and the number of successions. Um, and over time, sometimes you can decrease it um, as you realize that your crop is doing well. Um, uh, also adding hoop houses was helpful um, for not needing to plant quite as many plants um, since that can be better controlled. But last year is when the farmers started selling wholesale. Uh, so that helped to offload a lot of the extra produce. And when we do wholesale, we deliver and the cost of delivery, depending on radius, is factored into the price per pound. Thank you. Um, so a big challenge every year for us is um, when we are harvesting our summer boxes, but also having to plant for fall. Um, which I think with the uh, transplanting traditions, having that week off in August to, you know, actually be able to plant for the next season, why, you know, and not harvest at the same time is, is a great solution. Um, but what we uh, came across is um, the water reel transplanter, which allows us to significantly cut the amount of time of, because we have been basically hand transplanting um, everything prior to that, which take, ended up taking us weeks. And we would inevitably kind of fall behind for the fall, no pun intended, but um, with the transplanter that we just recently acquired, 
going forward that should eliminate that that challenge where the crunch is the you know harvesting and planting and maintaining and you know irrigate you know and everything is just kind of condensed into that um period in august uh that there's just not enough labor that we have available to get it all done in the time it needs to be done yeah, okay we had a question come in could you share the name of your uh your water wheel planner that you that you're utilizing on your farm the the name of it is it the rain rainbird was it rain rain, rain dance rainbird anyway we got it through uh berry hill irrigation rain float Rain Rainflow, flow. thank yeah. you, thank you, thank you very much. Right, <laughs> been there, right? <laughs> so we had a few questions I want to uh, go to before we come to our last question uh, that's in the chat. Uh, do any of you all utilize any CSA agreements, any formal agreements that the customer sign? We do. Um, actually, Rafi uh, drafted a contract that all of our members sign and which uh, lays out the like expectations and um, they they all sign that when they uh, get a share. So we do ha we do use a contract. And but the, the contract is really more of a guideline, not necessarily like, well, we're going to produce N number of these, N number of those, this, that, and the other. It's more or less, this is what you can kind of sort of expect. And mm -hmm. we're actually going to revamp that so we can get it a little bit more precise in terms of what we're actually delivering people. Because when we're trying to get more people on board, a lot of people want to know exactly what it is that they're going to be getting, as opposed to something that's a little bit, that sounds, that is a little bit nebulous. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Okay. Any others? Anything that? Uh, we don't have agreements, but we also have like um, during the CSA, we said if we ever have a crop failing or if we couldn't give them the produce, um, we would make it up. It's not just like, okay, it will resolve this week. It will solve it like in, immediately. So we don't have like agreement like that. All right, we had another question. Are any of you all accepting SNAP for your purchase of your your um, CSA boxes? Um, we actually are not, and um, it, we're just. It it would be a really honorable thing to be able to offer that, um, but with you know just being. Uh, mostly Steve on the farm because we have a two-year-old daughter and you know just <laughs> sitting down to you know understand and go through and get the the process of what it all entails to get the uh, program uh, connected with us to purchase the vegetables is I think more than we can take on right now but it would be a, it would be a great thing to to be able to offer. Right. Any others accepting SNAP or? Yes, we accept SNAP. And I'll just put a plug in for Raffi. That's something that we can offer some technical assistance around if your farm is thinking about uh, uh, trying to, to be able to accept SNAP on your farm. Let's see, and we'll see if we have any more questions here. Okay, so I'm going to do a kind of a final question and uh, we'll go with uh, Steve, Patrick, and then uh, Transplanting Traditions. These farmers that, that came on tonight, if you hit if that, you know, they're thinking about starting CSA, if it's one thing that you could share with them, or if they came and asked you about starting CSA, what would you share with them? I would, I would say start small. Yeah, I think you know if you're if you're a single farmer, it's to, you and your farm. Like ten shares would be a maximum to start out with, and then you that would really give you a, a nice baseline to understand if it's um, if you you know you can expand more shares the next year, or maybe you need to pull back a little bit and you know figure out what's really going to work for you. But um, the mistake we made was starting too big, so that would be. 
um, our first, our main piece of advice. And I would also add in that if you had the opportunity to just sit down with another farmer who's already involved in a CSA mm -hmm. and kind of like look over their shoulder for a couple of months just to see how it goes and participate in the deliveries or participate in the purchasing and get a good feel for what's going on, that would be extremely helpful. Patrick? I would say um, it can be a strategic way to start, but I would think this would be the smartest way to do it. That would be to work with an organization, a 501c3, such as Raffi, that already has established customers that already receive grant funding to start a project. If you start that way, you will understand how many shares are needed. Um, it'll, it'll be a structured plan and then go from working with one organization to marketing now a CSA opportunity to your community by engaging with the community first to find out how many members would be willing to sign up and to figure out what the price point would be to offer that CSA to your area. But working with a nonprofit first and creating a, pro a partnership there can get a, a beginning farmer or a new organization that's trying to create a CSA. It can be more profitable up front doing it that way. Thank you. Transplant Traditions? Um, I would say probably um, similar to Steve, starting small um, so you're not getting overwhelmed and also um, good communication with um, the customers so they understand what a CSA is, um, knowing that they might get vegetables that they're not familiar with um, and just building that sense of support so that if anything does happen, they are, it's not about the transaction, it's about them supporting your farm. Um, and Dawa, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, also, I mean, um, talk to other farmers and um, for, we learn a lot from other farmers at the farmer's market. I think it's a really great way to build uh, relationships there also with other farmers. And I hate to do it to you, but we had one more question coming to the chat and I'm gonna, this will be our last question. It came, uh, it asks, are any of you all serving marginalized communities and what challenges do you have face, uh, or challenges that you may face serving that population? I would say yes. Uh, being in a rural community as a, as where our farm is located, um, the median income is below 40,000, um, is an underpoverished area and Warren County and also considered a tier one community. What we have saw or seen in the past is that some of the product that we grow is the customer is not familiar with it. They don't know how to cook it. Um, they don't know what the nutritional value of the crop is for them. So what we did was we created recipes um, to provide into our box to explain how to cook and where the um, variety of vegetables originate throughout the world. Great idea. Anything else to add from the others? All right. Well, thank you all. And I know we had, oh, I'm sorry, Dawa, did you want to add something? I saw you come up. Oh, here. yes. I said at our farm, um, we partner up with Porsche organizations. So basically, we they would, um, they would, I said, raise money for the farmers to plant um, cultural relevant vegetables. And then we sell it to them and then they distribute it to um, low income families. Right. So, well, community partners. So I know we had some um, questions in the chat, maybe around like the contract that uh, Stephen Elka said that Raffi was able to assist with. I know Jared and uh, the others will share our emails at the end. So feel free to make sure you can reach out to Raffi, not only about that, but other technical assistance or programs that we have uh, operating there that we can assist you with. And I'm going to pass it back. I don't know, Jared, who am I passing it back to? <laughs> I think the angel. All right, Angel. Thank y'all. Hello. Um, I did not have anything prepared for closing, but that is fine. We have lots of interest in the chat. 
um, of people wanting to know, like, how do I start planning? What what do I do? Um, so if you want someone to like chat through that with, I'm very happy. I'm like in the process of starting a very small CSA. So I'm very happy to chat with people um, through that process. I can't promise that we will get you 100 members this coming spring, but I'm very happy to share what I've learned from these farmers and like visiting their farms and um, working on different farms. Um, so if you would like um, any other information on that, we're going to share the screen that has our contact information on it. Um, but those emails are relatively easy to remember. Mine is just angel at rafiusa.org. Um, and everyone at Rafi's email is just their first name plus that um, rafiusa.org. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, Thank you so much for all of the great questions in the chat. Um, there are also tons of resources out there, like your extension agencies um, most likely have at least a page of resources on their website um, that can be a great place to get you started. I shared one um, in the chat that's the Small Farms NC um, extension page that is a great um, resource to start with. Um, and thank you again to our panelists so much um, for sharing this knowledge with us um, and taking time on a Thursday evening at 7 p.m. to be here. Um, yeah, I think that is all that we have. Angel, Does any other Angel, stuff? <laughs> I wanted to add, I think Carol, uh, Carolina is going to follow up uh, with an evaluation to our attendees. And yes. uh, we really need you to fill that out because, you know, the, the topics and the contact that we're trying to um the topics we're trying to cover in these uh, webinar series, these aren't things that we're just sitting back in the office trying to come up with. We, we want to hear from your far you farmers on what you need uh, to be successful and viable. And that's the type of uh, the topics and, and trainings and things that we want to bring to you all. So please fill out that evaluation when you get it. And I, Carolyn, I don't know if you had anything else to add. No, that's that's great. Uh, we're gonna follow up, and I know there is someone who raised their hand. Jane, if you just we have just few minutes. If you want to talk, you can do it. Uh, just to close. Jane, are you there? If you want to talk, you just yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, I don't know, uh, Angel, you the one who said if we want to, I'm a new farmer, I'm organic farmer, I don't know how to start CSA, that's why I sign here so I can hear uh, how people do uh, CSA, but Angel, you said if I, if I can contact you, you will guide me on how to start a farm in north of Minneapolis one hour away from Minneapolis. So um, I'm thinking like, uh, I wanna start a CSA, but I don't know how. Yeah, um, I'm actually looking at your contact information in our registrant sp uh, spreadsheet. So I I'll send you an email after this. So it's top in your inbox and we can schedule a time to just chat through some things. Thank you. Well, thank you all, and thank you again to our panelists, and uh, thank you to my colleagues, and we really appreciate you signing on, and we hope that you will continue to uh, follow us on uh, our newsletters and get our um, information that we send out so we can continue to do these, and uh, please, especially if you're not a member of the Farm of Color Network and you're in the Southeast U.S., U.S. Virgin Islands of Puerto Rico, uh, that service area, please go on our website and uh, sign up and join. And that way you will be getting the information not only about our infrastructure grants and things that we have coming out, but also our programming and uh, the things that we offer around technical assistance and so forth. So thank you all. And we hope you have a wonderful night. Thank you all.